We are going to be back in the uh, book of Colossians today. Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. So if you have your Bibles, and like James said, you'll find it, most everybody here will have a Bible that they brought. And so they can look and compare, check up on the pastor. We encourage that. There's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, we compare the Word of God as we do our best to faithfully teach it, but we're imperfect vessels. And uh, so sometimes we, we need to be checked on some of the things that we say to make sure it's in accordance with the Word of God. So we're looking at Colossians chapter 3. And Lord willing, we'll be able to get through verses 15 and 16 today. Paul said... Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And the Lord had its blessings then to the reading of the Word. Paul begins to talk about, as in this particular verses, he says something, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ is the peace which Christ imparts. Jesus said that he would, when He would go away, He would leave His peace with us. So every one of us should be experiencing the peace of God. Now this peace that Paul's talking about here is the sanctifying or setting apart peace of God for the Christian. It's not the justifying peace of God. There's two kinds of peace of God scripturally, and I'll just touch on it here just for a second. There's peace with God. Peace with God is the yielding of our hearts and our minds and our spirits to Jesus Christ. When we cast ourselves upon Him and we say, God be merciful to me a sinner. As the publican did there, Jesus taught. The publican said, he spoke his breast. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went to his house. What? How did he go to his house? Justified. Thank you, Fred. He went to his house justified, perfectly in a right relationship with God Almighty. And he had the peace, uh, the peace with God. There's no longer, he's no longer at enmity with God. God and he, as the psalm says, there's nothing, there was nothing between his soul and the Savior. And when we have the peace uh, with God that, that He imparts to us, there's no more agitation, there's no more warfare. But we can also have the peace of God in our lives, and that is, as we just sang, some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire. That God leads us in these various ways of tri tribulations and trial, but He does it all through the blood. And when it's His blood working on our behalf, speaking on our behalf, and then we have the peace of God in the midst of tremendous trials. And many books are written about Christians who may, who have the peace of God in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances. They already have peace with God. Their hearts were right before God. But in the midst of all hell and high water, they have the peace of God. I think of my parents when our, when our house was... Uh, com uh, completely destroyed basically in a flood in the 1966 flood here in Three Rivers. If, you're, if you know the history and, and of, of the Three Rivers area and the Cahuilla area, most people are very familiar with the 1955 flood. Mike Schroeper would know about the, the, the 55 flood because that's prior to the dam being there when the entire valley was flooded and homes in Visalia were flooded. And the 55 flood was so tremendous that homes along the river were, many homes were, were washed away. We had a couple here, uh, the wife is buried in our church uh, ecclesiastical mortuary. Uh, her home as a daughter, as a teenage daughter or in her 20s, was completely wiped out in the 55 flood. Well, when the 66 flood came, most of those houses uh, had, you know, were, were wiped out in 55, so it didn't have the, the, uh, the impact. The impact that the 66 flood had, but our house was one of those that was spared in the 55 flood. I think there was two homes and a trailer park that was completely washed out in the 66 flood. But in that 66 flood, I remember my parents having the peace of God. 
Not only the experience of peace with God, knowing that they were in right, right relationship with our Heavenly Father, but in the midst of those terrible circumstances, they had the peace of God. By the way, interesting to note, in the 1966 flood, when the house was completely destroyed in a flood, they were also in the middle of a battle for the church to be built. People think about the government as DJ, and rightly so, talked about the government's antagonistic position against the church today. But in 1966, the full forces of hell were brought against uh, mom and dad and the starting of this church. And so while he's gone before the planning commission to seek a permit, and there's been signatures uh, garnered from as far away as Orosi and Dinuba and all around the, the valley, signatures were gathered so that a church would not be built here in Korea. I won't go into all the details of it, but that's where they were in 1966. And then on top of that, a flood comes and destroys the pastor's home. Oh, the gates of hell were working, uh, Satan was working overtime in Korea Commonwealth at that time. But mom and dad had the peace of God in the midst of that horrendous situation. I was about uh, 66, I was about seven years old. Yes? You don't forget the end of the story. The church was built, is still here, and so is the pastor's home. Yes, yes, the church was built right. And the pastor built further up the river. <laughs> the new house was built on higher ground, and the house that uh, that still left of that flood, that Warren, Luke, and Jenna live in, and Dad spent many years building a rock wall so that the high waters would be pushed a different direction. So he, he learned a lesson there too. All right, but he had the peace. They, Mom and Dad had the peace of God in the midst of horrific circumstances. So in this particular case, Paul says, "Let the peace of God rule in your hearts." The let. How do we let the peace of God rule in our hearts? Because see, he says here, let the peace of God rule in our hearts. Well, there's another word we need to look at, which is key, and that is the word rule. The word rule here, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. This word rule will be key for us. It's the Greek word, rabioo, rabiuo, which means to arbitrate or umpire. Very interesting word here. Rule is to be an umpire or arbitrate. The peace of God is to be a decider of all things within our hearts. If we're watching a baseball game, you have an umpire. And the man is going from, he's stealing from first base to second base. And he makes a slide and the catcher is, sees him going from first base, trying to steal second base. Everybody that follows baseball understands the analogy. Catcher throws the ball to the second baseman. The second baseman reaches down and tries to tag him before he reaches second base. And then the umpire has to make a decision. Did he make it safe or is he out? Did the, did the glove of the ball touch it before he touched the second base, right? So we follow that analogy. But what is going on there? The umpire is deciding safe or out. And the guy's coming to home plate and he slides in. And, you know, the catcher's there, and there's a big, giant collision, and the dust flies and everything. An umpire is there to decide, is he safe or is he out? So the, this is a very interesting term here. Paul is saying that, that the peace of God should be deciding, a deciding factor in our hearts. We are to let or submit to Jesus Christ as the umpire of our conflicting emotions. Our emotions are conflicting in regards to something that is happening in our lives or something that we're doing. The peace of God is to be an umpire, an arbiter of the final way in which we're going to go. Many of you have experienced and can testify of living for, for Christ for, for many years that in the final analysis, the decision that you made was because you couldn't get away from the peace of God in this particular decision. Whatever it was, you had the peace of God. Many a missionary in tremendous conflicts on foreign fields and facing a death and persecution, while there was a certain fear and trepidation, they overcame that spirit of fear by power and of love and of a sound mind, and they had the peace of God, which took them through all those trials and tribulations. So the peace of God is to be an umpire amongst our conflicting emotions. But not only individually, this is written to the church at Colossae, so it's written to the body. Notice, if you would, the language here. In verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. 
to the which also you are called in one body. He's tying peace not only to an individual, but more actually in primary context here to the body of believers in which they are uh, participating with Christ. Hold your hand in Colossians 3. Go back just a few pages to Ephesians chapter 4. Note what Paul said to the church at Ephesus here. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. He says a big word here. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So speaking to the church at Ephesus, he says endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That word endeavoring means to wrestle. Wrestle. You work hard at keeping the Spirit in the bond of peace within the body of Christ. We're to endeavor to do that. We're to wrestle to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so he says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in Colossians here, to which also you are called in one body. Now let me just say here, uh, it's a historical note, the church at Korea has been blessed with peace and unity throughout most of its existence. The only time basically we didn't have a prevailing peace and unity, the church at Korea, was during the split over the Lordship of Jesus Christ circa 1991 and 1992. Satan had got into the church and brought in a spirit of fear and people were, you know, all kinds of fear and fear mongering was taking place. And so the peace of the, the spirit in the, in the body and the bond of peace was being disrupted at that time, 19, in, a, in around 1991. And eventually it erupted into a, what's known as a church split where a fair amount of the congregation goes another direction and some of the congregation remain here. Some of you were here in those days. I know Mona was. I can't remember if Gene was. But some of you would have been here in those days. We were in Oregon, preaching up in Oregon in those days, but we were a part of the support of the unregistering of the church, the unincorporating of the church. The battle was for would Jesus Christ have the preeminence in the church at Korea, and many people got fearful when Dad proposed to unincorporate the church, bring it back under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and so we had a split. But the existence of the church from 1965 to 2014, we're almost on the, on the precipice of 2015, what is that? Uh, excuse me, 1965 to 2015 is what, 60, 50 years? All right, has been one. We're blessed with the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. As I speak to you the last few Sundays, I recognize there isn't an agitative current underneath. Many churches experience an un, what's called an undercurrent of agitation. Half the people or 10% of the people are mad at the pastor, they're mad at this person or that person. We have been blessed with a, with a very much a spirit of peace. A, a lot of churches will go through a split every five or six years. Anybody been in a church that split uh, at just with regularity? Five, six years, 10 years, church split, church split. That doesn't happen. We're very grateful to the Lord at the Church of Quia. That spirit of agitation, that undercurrent, is not here, and it has not been here historically. Somebody gets mad at the pastor, and they leave. But they can't influence the other people. We almost had it here. I attempted that about uh, six weeks ago or so. A man and his wife came, and they were prepared to bring an undercurrent, some of you know what I'm talking about, to bring a dissension in the church. Well, when they began to put out their feelers, they realized it wasn't going to go anywhere fast, and so they never even attempted. They had planned on it because their spirit of, of, of love and peace is here, and we should wrestle to keep that spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Let me just say, I love to quote, I'd love, love to give this little illustration because we were talking about the unregistering of the church and how it brought a lot of, uh, it split the congregation up, I believe. I think it was two-thirds of the church left and one-third stayed during that split. But, I, but one of the men had been at the Church of Quia a long time, when, because we were a corporation at that time, we were a not-for-profit corporation, therefore, the church members, it was like a democracy, you had to vote by a 51% margin, that's where all the corporate churches are down in the valley and here locally as well, and all across the United States. It's a democracy. It's not run according to the Word of God. So 51% of the vote turned the tide whether the church would stay, state church corporate, 
with a 501c3 not for profit status or 51% would determine we want out of that not for profit corporate status. Do you understand that? So at that night, that Sunday night, when they were having a vote and they were having the discussion just prior to the vote, a man said, I'm against the church unincorporating because Pastor Campbell, that would be my father, Pastor Warren Lee, will have all of the authority. There'll be no checks and balances. He says, so I'm voting against it because we don't know what he's going to do with the money, all kinds of things. We need checks and balances. Well, the irony of that is that man went down to the valley. He left in the split and he supported a church for many years, a very large church that has all the corporate trappings, all the protections, all the checks and balances, and lo and behold, about 10 years later, the secretary ran off with how much? Two million dollars. Two million dollars of the church funds. So the Lord has a sense of humor. While he feared that the church in Korea was going to go berserk and the pastor was going to take advantage of the people and run off with all the funds, he attended and supported the church with his ties where the secretary abstained $2 million before they even realized she had done it. So I tell you what, the mega churches have money out the... They have a lot of money. That's <laughs> yeah. All right. So, But anyway, it's kind of funny, wasn't it? I'm voting. we got to have checks and balances. We need corporate status. And he went to a church where the secretary had scammed off $2 million before they realized what has happened. I'm a real welcome. I would like. To, I know who he is, and uh, someday, if the Lord will allow me, I will re bring that to his remembrance because he actually needs to repent. Those that uh, left the church in that split, there was all kinds of gossip, there was all kinds of uh, dissension, and uh, they need to repent because uh, God wants to have Jesus Christ wants to have a preeminent in the church. Uh, now, so we're talking about in the church, but what happens is. I want you to note this. People who don't have peace, check this out with your own experience. People who don't have peace in their own lives try to wreak havoc on the peace of the Lord's body in the church. You will see that. Say that again. People who don't have the peace of God, who don't have peace in their own lives, they try to wreak havoc on the peace of the Lord's body in the church. We used to have a lady here years ago. She, you, anybody that knew her knew she did not care. She did not walk in a cognizance of the peace of God in her life. Always agitated, always high strung, always on the verge of a blow up, always on the verge of a you know a, a, of a you know a whoop de doo. And she would always and she would bring that with her to church. People were, were walking on eggshells around her because they never knew when she was going to blow up. And so, if she would, if she could, she would have wreaked havoc because she did not have the peace of God. Some churchgoers just aren't happy unless they're in the middle of a brawl. Uh, yeah. Think about that for a minute. If you've been in church a long time, and like I said, if you just attended the Church of Korea, you've been blessed, you don't know that. But there's a lot of churches that you can go to where there are people that are just plain old agitators. And they aren't happy unless they're in the middle of a big brawl, so to speak, in the church. Anybody know people like that? Anybody been to a church like that? There's a church here locally for a long time. The numbers stayed way down. I'm talking five or six people for the longest time because the controlling entities in that church was a woman who was a brawler and just had to have everything her way all the time. And anybody that would come in, unless she could lord it over them, she wasn't happy, and so church just was constantly splitting. And so you'd have it build up to a congregation of twelve, and split back down to four. Yeah. And build up to a congregation, and then split again. Just constant professional agitators. That's why I use the term sometimes. I I use the term blessed subtractions in the church world. Now the the the, the mega churches, the emergent churches, don't understand this. They want every number to say that uh, to show their success within the church, and maybe that person will flip a $5 bill in the offering at the end, and they can get all the money that they want. But I'm thankful that some people have left the church at Korea. I call it a blessed subtraction. Now, I like to build the church at Korea. I wish the, the place was full. I, 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 I'm certainly. But there are times when these agitators go, and they can't find, they can't wreak havoc, so they're not happy. They've got to go somewhere else where they can put dissension, they can put the undercurrent because that's where they're most at peace is when they're causing an undercurrent. So I just say, 
Not only can we have blessed additions when new folks come in and we're thankful and we bless the Lord for that, but we can also be thankful when folks leave. The same door that lets us in to the church is the same door that we can exit as well. All right, so he says, let the peace of God rule. Let it be the arbiter, let it be the umpire of the decisions in your life to the which also you are called in one body. The body of Christ should not be fragmented. There should be peace within it. And then he says, and be thankful. Be ye thankful. Hold your hand in Colossians and open, if you would please, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. A little note here on the importance of being thankful. I'll be good reading in uh, verse 18 of chapter, Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Man, the, 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 the created world is enough to testify. My dad used to say there's enough revelation of a blade of grass to convince any man to follow God. There's enough revelation that you can take that blade of grass and look at it under a microscope. There's enough life there to convince any man about the existence and creation of God, so that they're without excuse. Now, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. The non-Christian is a truth suppressor. He knows the reality of God, the truth of God, but he suppresses that. They knew God and does not give Him glory as the Creator, and then it says, and they were neither thankful. They're not thankful people. We want to be a people that are thankful. And then that lack of thanksgiving led them into the generation that the rest of Romans chapter 1 talks about. So one of the ways that we can keep from going down that descent, that spiral, that negative spiral, is to be a people that are thankful. Called into one body, verse 15, and be thankful. It's also interesting to note as we examine, think about our own lives and people that we know and our experiences. It's interesting to note that an unthankful person does not have peace. You know, first I talk about people that are that are that are very agitated. There are also people that don't there are also people that don't have peace in their lives. Unthankful people don't have peace. But thankful people, appreciative people, tend to have a lot of peace in their lives. They ask you, do you find yourself constantly thanking and praising God for what He has done throughout your daily life? Are you thanking God? Are you praising God? One way to do that is to have, we're going to be, which we talked, which we're going to hear in just a minute now, have music and songs that glorify the Lord uh, that you're listening to and that causes your mind to be appreciative, cause your mind to go on God and be thankful. I remember many years ago I was working with a man, he was changing his U-joints at, at my house and in my garage, and so we pulled the truck in there, and he was under there, and in those days I always had a cassette player, and so I popped in, I think it was Praise 3 or Praise 4, some of you remember the Praise albums, and so here, here he was under there working on the U-joints, and immediately I'd hear from the underneath the car, ooh, praise the Lord, it's oh, glory to God, as he heard praise choruses emanating from the garage, he immediately walked in that tune, that awareness of being thankful and praising the Lord. So now he's tying together, verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called into one body, and be ye thankful. Then he says, then let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The Word of Christ, in this case, the Word or message spoken by Christ. Let it dwell in us richly, the Word or message of Christ. Taking this verse as a whole teaches us 
that singing, now here's, I'm going to listen to this, this is, you might find this unusual. Taking this verse as a whole, it teaches us that singing aids in the digestion of the Word of God. Singing is an aid in the digestion of the Word of God that it might take lodging and produce fruit and strength in our lives. This cannot be understated. So that which we call our song service or our worship service plays a vital role in the teaching and admonishing taking place in corporate worship. Let me read that to you again. We take the whole of this totality of this verse here. Take, let the word of Christ on you richly, admonishing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. This verse as a whole teaches us that singing aids in the digestion of the word of God. Another way to look at that, Dad used to give the, uh, the old illustration of the cow chewing the cud and the, the what's the rumination? I believe it's rumination, isn't it? Cow rumination. All right. So the cow chews grass and he's laying down there on the on the on the lawn or in, in the valley. He's chewing the grass and then he's relaxing for a minute and then you see him do something and he goes and he spits up the grass to chew it again. He's ruminating on that grass and redigesting. He get more enzymes and more vitamins from it, and he's doing this as a process. So what we see here is that, and, and that's his digestive process, all right, rumination. So we are to ruminate on the Word of God. The psalmist says that we are to meditate, in, in, in about a fact, he says, in his law I meditate day and night. Just as the cow chewing the cud, continually getting more vitamins, more strength from that rumination. So we too, song is a way to keep the Word of God at the forefront. Song is a way to keep the Word of God alive in our hearts. Singing is a way to keep the Word of God alive in our hearts. That's why we try to choose songs that you can take with you, not just today the songs that we sang, but they could, they'll have an impact on your life. Many of the time, my mom told me that on a Sunday evening, she'd wake up in the middle of the night and one of the songs that we had sung that day or later on that week would come to her mind in the middle of the night. She said, yeah, I remember that singing that. And so that's the aid in the digestion of the Word of God. So taking this verse as a whole teaches us that singing aids in the digestion of the Word of God. This cannot be understated. So that which we call our song service plays a vital role in the teaching and admonishing taking place in corporate worship. By the way, as a side note, you've noticed the last few months, at the end of the service, we're also singing a song. Why? To aid in the digestion of the morning sermon. Okay, so that's important why do it. Put it. To put it plainly, our song service is not filler. It's not that we're trying to get a good hour and a half out of the church because we've got a lot of people that have driven from an hour away, some David Elmer an hour and a half away, and so we want to make sure he has a lot on his plate, so we're going to sing songs for 20 minutes or a half hour because some of you come from a long distance. No, 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 no. The song service is not filler at all. It's vital in the aid and digestion of the Word of God. As a pastor, I've been concerned, many for people, I've been concerned about those people who habitually cannot make it to church on time. Now, if you came to church today and you came five minutes late for whatever reason, and that's not your habit, not a problem, maybe the tire was flat, you had to get air, whatever, maybe the traffic was bad coming up the hill, around the lake. But we've had people who habitually, week in and week out, come 20 minutes late, 15 minutes late, half hour late, for a period of years. Doesn't make any difference what the pastor, what my dad would preach, doesn't make any difference what I'd preach, be in church on time they habitually would be 15, 20 minutes, half hour late. What is that saying? That is saying that the song service, they do not understand this concept of song and singing as a digestion to the Word of God. They totally, to them, the song service, well, if I make it on time, fine. If I don't, fine. If I miss out, don't mean anything to me. They're missing this principle that Paul is teaching us here. The Word of God is to be richly, to let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. For the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly, the imagery Paul says is using here means to live in a home. So the Word of Christ dwelling in us, that word dwell is literally living in a home. That the Word of God would be at home in your life. 
the Word of God would be at home in my life. That's an ideal for us. Paul uses this imagery to live in a home. The Bible is to be at home in our hearts. Christian music can be a big part of this when played in your homes. I'm not talking about some wild, uh, you know, uh, life metal or some crazy illusion like that. Yeah. We had a young man years ago, I, I hadn't talked to him for many years, and he, I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, pastor. He says, I'm in life metal. I said, what on earth is that? So we you know what death metal is. Yeah, I've heard of death metal. Well, life metal is they play the still the crazy, horrible music, and they just scream, Jesus, Jesus, and it's out every few sentences or something like that. Our God is alive. Well, this horrible, you know, music that grates the nerves and causes agitation within. How many of you know the old experiences they did? Some of you old, if you're old enough like me today, you remember the experiments that non-Christians, not church people, did in the 60s and 70s. And how in the 70s and uh, late 60s, they would have plants growing, and, and, and they would have Beethoven, and they would have soothing music, and the plants would flourish, and they would play that, that horrible, you know, mellow rock music that was going on, and the plants would shrivel up and die. Now, that's not done by church people. That's done by scientists. And so, that you know, the, the pastors then would use that as an illustration in the 60s and 70s. So we're talking about music that is... That has the grace, as Paul here says at the end, grace in your hearts of the Lord. Music that has is imbued with the grace of God in it. So Christian music can be a big part of this when played in our homes. And of course, it's certainly done in our churches. So he says, then let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So, oh, by the way, I don't think I got a chance to do this. By the way, thank the Lord for reminding me. I Just about two weeks ago, somebody sent me an email. And it was one of these metal Christian rock artists. Now, this you can get this on YouTube. If you want me to prove it, I'll prove it for you, and I'll get it on YouTube, because I, I can still find it. I forget what this guy did. He, oh, I know, he come out and... He's a, he's a famous guy, and I don't even remember the band that he plays. in contemporary, right now going on as we speak today. Or it was as of a few months ago. He come out and confessed that he was an atheist, and he'd been singing on the Christian rock circuit oh, for a long time. And he said, and he said, what, what's all the fanfare about? Most of the guys that I'm associated with are atheists in the Christian rock circuit. They don't believe. They're just they're making money. How many of you remember uh, Gene? Gene, the creature. Gene. Somebody help me. Scott. There. Thank you, Pastor Gene Scott. I remember him back in the '70s saying, "Most of these Christian rock people, they're failures in the world of rock. They're no good. So they find and they find a home in the gullible Christians uh, in, in, in Christian rock music. And so, if you want that, I'll get that for you. That, that he's a good, he's a leading rock singer. He says, "I'm an atheist. I'm finally going to come out and say it." And he says, most of the people in our industry are atheists as well. But the Christians gobble this up, make them multi-millionaires by playing that in their homes, subjecting their teenage children to that garbage, and saying it's Christian. Mm -hmm. That's their own confession, not the words of this local big preacher. All right. Now, if you can't say amen, say, oh, me. Oh, my. Amen. All right. So, Paul says, we admonish one another. We teach one another. Teaching is the doctrine, admonishing is the encouraging. I'm, in, I'm admonishing you guys to stay away from life metal, so-called life metal. That's an admonishment today. <coughs> Teaching, but I'm also admonishing, encouraging. It's not going to draw you to the world. Now, he says, we do this in singing, admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs kind of covering the, the gambit of Christian music there, if you would. Psalms, we get the idea of the Psalter. We we sang a, a psalm this morning. You probably you may not have been aware of it, but when we sang the Lord is good and he's a stronghold in the day of trouble, that was directly singing from the psalm. So we sing from the psalms, uh, probably maybe not every Sunday, but we do it all the time. And sometimes, so you may not even be aware of it. Most of the hymns that we sing are based upon fragments of, of scriptural verses anyway. So we sang psalms this morning. We sang hymns, which were originally poems sung as praise to God. We sang what we would call two hymns this morning. We're singing psalms, we're singing hymns, and then we're singing spiritual songs. Spiritual songs, he uses the word spiritual there to denote the Christian character or composition of that which is being sung. 
So we end, we sang, you know, for thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. That's singing the psalms again. But it's also what we would call a Christian chorus that has been put, music and words that are put to based upon the psalm. So we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. Spiritual songs is a beautiful thing, folks. The book of Isaiah says a couple of times, sing a, what kind of song unto the Lord? Sing a new song. We're going to make a joyful noise unto the Lord in the book of Psalms. But in Isaiah, a couple of times, he admonishes the people to sing a new song unto the Lord. What is that new song unto the Lord? That new song is a song that you, that the Holy Spirit inspires you or me to write or someone else to write concerning a work that God has just done contemporaneously in our lives. So, a new song might be, let's say the, the uh, civil magistrate has come against us for some reason, and it, uh, it doesn't look good, and the civil magistrate has come against us before at times, it didn't look that good, but God gives us great victory. So in that, someone writes a song about the victory that God has just wrought in his church amongst his people. That becomes a spiritual song, a testimony to what God is doing in the now. The Bible says Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. So I like testimonies in the, the Bible text of his miracle working, but I also like miracle working in 20th century and 21st century Christianity as well. Did I give you an example of that? Yeah. Yes. Of that. We're almost done here. Yeah, I'm on the last. Contemporary. God working in this. When, when Dad and I uh, started the ecclesiastical mortuary over here, I did a lot of study because we understood that what the government defines, it regulates. And when you're dealing with the civil magistrate, he who defines the terms generally wins. So we began. I did my research and I found out that the government controls two things in this regard. It controls public cemeteries and private cemeteries. If you want to be a public cemetery, like there's down in Visalia, is the Visalia Public Cemetery. Very, very, very big cemetery there in Visalia. You can have a private cemetery. Sometimes Catholic cemeteries, or you might have a Masonic cemetery, is a private cemetery. But either way, the government's going to control those entities. Well, we're a church here that, you know, the property in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to a beneficial owner, and so it's in a different status. So when we wanted to put in a place to take care of our, to bury our loved ones, I realized that when we went to the civil magistrate, I couldn't be a private cemetery or a public cemetery. Why? Because they would say, where's your permit to operate a private cemetery? Where's your license to operate a public cemetery? So we, so I, I began to study, and I found out that historically, Christians, according to Black's Law Dictionary, have had an ecclesiastical mortuary, which is a fancy term for a, a burial ground for their dead. An ecclesiastical mortuary. So, Dad and I go to the place uh, because we're getting a permit for the a disposition of removal of the rem of remains. So what we did was we took three bodies from the Three River Cemetery and moved them over to this property. And how many of you know, Dad and I just didn't get a backhoe and say, well, let's just dig right here, son. I think we can find this to be a good spot. It didn't happen that way, right? You just don't go to a cemetery and bring your backhoe or your shovel and start digging it up. That's, you get yourself in trouble quick. You've got to have some proper paperwork. So we were going to the, the place called Vital Statistics with the proper paperwork. To get the proper paperwork to do a Disney term. All right. So Dad was there. I think I've told you this story before. I like to do it because it's showing you the power of Jesus Christ in the now. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. So I done my study and I said, Dad, if we ask for a, a permit for disposition of, of for disinterment of the remains to move them from one place to another, she'll ask for, well, where's your license? Where's your number? Where's your permit? And I said, I can't say it's for a private cemetery, a public cemetery, because it's going to put it in their jurisdiction. And he said, Yeah, you're right. So I said, you know, what we, we do have is an ecclesiastical mortuary. Now if she asks me, where are these bodies going to go to? And I say, the ecclesiastical mortuary, she's never heard that term before. That's going to put up a red flag. So I can't win for losing. So what we did was, I remember we were in the car before we went in and we prayed. And I said, God, give me wisdom because I don't know what to say. And DJ just read about God putting in our mouths the words that we need to say, right? All right. 
I don't know what to say. I can't say either one of the three terms because it's going to probably put up a red flag. So Dexy's an older gal. Dad comes in with his joke, uh, why shouldn't you steal a pig? Well, because he'll squeal on you and he's doing all that. She liked, <laughs> she liked his humor. So that was good. So she went after they bantered about with Dad and his horrible humor. So, so she, she said, well, you know, what are you here for? And said, well, we'd like to... Uh, Get it, you know, dis, dis, uh, dis, what is it, a disinter Determine. permit, Determine. yeah, permit to disinter three bodies and put them in. And she said, uh, Where's, where, what's this for? Where's it going? And I literally went like this. I went, because I didn't know what to say. In this case, the Lord put the words in this lady's mouth to say, she said, is it for a church cemetery? And I said, yes. And I said, yes, it is. Okay. 15 bucks per body, and you got it. Now, here's the kicker. There are no church cemeteries in Tulare County. None, zilch. She had no background at law in her experience in biostatistics to know about ecclesiastical mortuaries or church cemeteries. The Holy Spirit literally put that in her mind and in her mouth at that time. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever because I hesitated. I did not know what to say. And she volunteered, volunteered, is it for a church? And I said, yes. And she said, okay, 15 bucks. So that's an example <laughs> from a writing song. The song could have been written about that experience. That, that's what I'm talking about. So we, so spiritual song, we're talking about spiritual song about contemporaneous activities in our lives are the choruses oftentimes that we sing about the things that God is doing in our life. So we have, Paul says we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You will note that we use all three here at the church at Kawea. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Hold your hand in Colossians 3 and go back to Ephesians chapter 5 for just a moment if you would please. Ephesians chapter 5. You'll find that Ephesians 5 and 19 is very similar to Colossians 3, 16. So I need to point out before we close here, just something real quick to pass. So Paul says to Ephesus in Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, we have singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Here we have making melody. Now, the, 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 the reason why I bring this up is because the word melody is the Greek word salo, which means to twitch, twang, or pluck, whereby we would play a stringed instrument with the fingers. So Paul, as he's writing to the church at Ephesus here, notice he says, speaking to yourself, not just an individual, but within the context of the church, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That Greek word there, pluck, twang, twitch, the playing of a stringed instrument. We mention that because how many of you are familiar with the churches of Christ? They're very popular here in the valley, but they're, all, they're very popular in the south. There's a segment of the Churches of Christ, which is a denomination that teaches that instruments are not to be used in corporate worship. And everybody ever been to a Church of Christ where you cannot use instrumentation? Yeah. And they say the reason why we cannot use instrumentation is because the, the New Testament nowhere condones the use of an instrument in its worship. They'll recognize that instruments all. I mean, it's a replete throughout the Old Testament. But they are where, where those that would divide their word up. We take what we call the doctrine of tota scriptura. We believe in tota scriptura. That is, from Genesis to Revelation, this is the word of God. And we believe that the Old Testament, according to Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16, was written for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, right? There's, there's a number of Christians today that hold that the Old Testament does not teach doctrine and reproof and correction, instruction, and righteousness. Therefore, they say because the New Testament does not specifically authorize musical instruments, we won't have them in our church. There's no pianos, no guitars, nothing like that. Did you have something, Dave? Can I offer this? You said yeah. from Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God. But to emphasize that, it's the inherent Word of God. There is no mistake. Those same people will hold up translation errors they think yeah. And I maintain the fact that they don't know today that they're wrong about it. In, yeah, it's inerrant. We believe it's literally, as Paul says, 
that Timothy God breathed. Now, so I just mentioned this as we're talking about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and making melody, that the word there, if, if you, if you, for those that throw out the Old Testament, and there's a lot of Christians in, in America that even throw out the Old Testament, within the New Testament context, we, I'm just simply trying to demonstrate, we have a verse here where it appears that instrumentation is taking place because it's the pluck, it's the twang, it's the twitch on a stringed instrument, from well, the Greek there, pluck, twang, twitch. And that's, you do that with a stringed instrument. So we have, in the book of Ephesus, instrumentation, I believe. Just a little point there when you're dealing with Church of Christ folks, okay? You can talk about Toda Scriptura or this aspect, whichever you want to do. I just, think, just need to mention that. Because if you don't know about the Church of Christ that's down there by Seth, there's probably half a dozen in by Seth. And they do not use instruments. They're very proud of the fact that they do not use instruments. They believe they're obeying us out of obedience to the Word of God. All right, so in closing then, Paul says that we sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. This, this presents the essence of our singing. The essence of our worship is grace. Divine grace operating through us and God, divine grace operating toward the Father. It's what one man, Gene Edwards, called re-radiating. That is, the grace of God, the love of God is come and it's been shed abroad in our hearts and we re-radiate it back to Him. And one of the ways we give that love back to Him is through song. Songs, hymns, and spiritual songs are to be an extension of the grace of God in our lives. It's a way in which we give back to Him. So that's why it's not just a small portion or a filler in the morning worship service. It's a time when you give back to Him. You re-radiate his love and grace back to him. Colossians reminds us that from the beginning, the church of Jesus Christ was a singing church. And we need to continue that wonderful tradition today and into the future. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. I thank you for encouraging us, Lord, to let the word of Christ be an umpire in our lives. And Lord, that the word of Christ might dwell in us richly through admonishing one another in songs, hymns, and spirituals. Thank you for the attendance of this, your people. I pray your blessings upon them in Jesus' name. Amen.